Okay, so that's the same in the class. So I'll just give another example, just quickly here, of the cultural electives, right? So <laughs> cultural electives are customs that you may conform to, but you don't have to. Do you understand? Optional, not obligation. Okay? You could feel uncomfortable, so you don't have to do it. For example, in the Czech Republic, they offer you some liquor at the start of business meetings. Do you like liquor? Liquor, like vodka? Uh, very strong drink. Do you like liquor? <laughs> no? Don't drink every day? No? So probably you don't want to drink it, right? So you don't have to. It's just an ele you can say, no, it's okay. Right? I don't want to drink the liquor. Then the Czech people will understand you're not from Czech Republic. It's okay. Okay? But you could, it might be a good idea to accept and take a very small amount, right? Or just do like that, right? When they're not looking. Throw it over, <laughs> over your shoulder, right into the plant. There's a plant behind me. <laughs> that kind of thing. Right? Of course, I'm just joking, but uh, just take a small amount, right? In the Middle East, they offer you coffee. But you don't like coffee. You don't have to drink it, okay? Well, you could drink it if you want, just to make them happy. Okay, but cultural imperative are customs that you must conform to if you want to be successful. Okay? For example, building the relationship in Asian countries or making people lose face. Okay? Raising your voice. Don't raise your voice in the Asian countries. Just don't shout, right? Cultural imperatives. So then let's continue here. So we can have some. Uh, cultural issues that we're going to discuss between we just noticed now even Austria was a little bit similar to the US, right? So we can talk about Western area and Eastern area as a different culture, right? So the ch for example, the Chinese perceive contracts as too rigid to take new circumstances into account. So they have no problem with changing the term of the agreement. Even though we made an agreement, we can change it. So something later because the circumstances changed okay so the western business people might be surprised that they need to renegotiate their contract again with the chinese party uh, so we talked about this one the relationship we saw that this was a big one right executives in north america and northern europe austria and the us they don't they don't really need a relationship to do a deal Okay? They don't need to know you well. If I make a deal with somebody, I don't need to make a relationship with them. Do you understand? Just I'll just go on the, the facts. Okay? But in East Asia, we, they want to have a more extensive relationship. Latin America the same, and Southern Europe, Spain and France the same. Okay? Well, France is kind of in the middle. Okay, so this implies different levels of emphasis on the underlying social contracts. So, can the arrangement be understood as a business relationship or is it more personal or social? In Northern Europe and North America, it's just a business relationship. Okay? In the other countries, they want to have a more personal relationship. Our relationships with employees, customers and suppliers understood in economic terms or are they more complicated? So this is a different issue in the different cultures. <clears throat> so here's an example. A new US plant manager arrived in Japan and he started downsizing. Do you understand downsizing? It means making the staff smaller. So he thought this unit has too much staff. They don't need the staff, so we're going to downsize. Even though the company is already making a profit. So there was a big resistance of the employees because they think this violates the social contract. Okay? Maybe the social contract may be stronger in Asia. So another a union, the workers' union, had a big problem with this. So they wanted the salary increase and they insisted about job guarantees. Local suppliers refused to do business with the company. Okay? 
they thought it's not trustworthy. Even a decade, 10 years later, after the manager left, the suppliers were still boycotting the company. Do you understand boycott? Yes. So the American guy thought it's just business. Just fire these people, no problem. Okay? But the suppliers didn't like that. They thought, uh, it looks like you're not very trustworthy, you don't have a good relationship with your workers, I don't want to do business with you. So in Japan, this kind of relationship is important. So we're going to talk about Chinese negotiation behavior. Korea's biggest trade partner. Which country is Korea's biggest trade partner? China. China, right? Also, I did an exchange in China, so I studied about Chinese negotiation and uh, Chinese history there. Okay? So we're going to study a bit about that. So many Westerners think Chinese negotiators are inefficient. Do you understand inefficient? Wasting time wasting money, right? Indirect, don't say things directly. Okay? And even dishonest. Because they don't say things directly, they might say they're dishonest. Chinese negotiators can say that the Western counterparts are aggressive, right? Very individualistic or aggressive. You understand aggressive? I want this. I want that. Give me this. Okay? Impersonal. Impersonal. They don't care about being your friends or not, right? Do you understand the personal? Yes. They don't care about you. They just care about the business. Okay? And insincere. Insincere means uh, in McDonald's, they might say, have a nice day. Does the worker behind the counter really want me to have a nice day? No. No, they're being insincere. Do you understand? It's not sincere. They might say that, those things, like have a nice day, blah, 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 but they don't really mean it. They're just saying that because they think. They have to say that as part of their job, right? So we can have this problem between the Chinese and the Western negotiators. So first of all, let's look at the cultural roots to understand about the Chinese negotiation culture. So we're going to talk about Confucianism. Do you know Confucianism? Chinese cultural heritage. How do you say Confucianism in Korean? Confucius. The kind of religion in China. Have you heard of that before? Confucianism? Korean also has it. Uh, Yu-Gyo. Do you know Yu-Gyo? Taoism? Taoism. How do you say Taoism in Korean? Taoism. Tokyo, Tokyo. Tokyo, Tokyo? Tokyo. More strategy. More strategy. China has, I can see on the Korean TV, you have a lot of TV programs about different China, in Chinese history fighting against each other, right? Yes. And they have some, a lot of strategy books. You understand strategy? Yes. About the war. Then uh, China has a planned economy, okay, and also their, this is their history. And now they are getting international exposure. So. All of those things affect uh, the Chinese one. So the cultural roots first. So for example, patience is a famous virtue in Confucianism. Are you patient? Patient? Are you patient? In English we have a saying. Do you understand virtue? Yes. Patience is a virtue. Have it if you can. Always in a woman, never in a man. Okay? So in English saying it's like women are more patient than men. Okay? Now, if you look at the kindergarten, usually women are working in kindergarten because you have to be very patient with the kids, right? An orientation towards harmonious relationships. Harmony. You understand harmony? Yes. Do you guys like harmony? Yes. I don't care about harmony. <laughs> we don't have a harmonious relationship. Doesn't matter. Maybe we'll perform better if we're not in harmony. I think. Right? If we're too much harmony, we might not be performing best that we need to be, right? But this Taoism idea, we should have a harmonious relationship, okay? And then the survival instinct, the war strategy. So, <coughs> China had a lack of, China, do you know anything about Chinese history? 
What happened to China in the 20th, 19th century or 20th century? She's the name of the in China. No, to Western country invade China. Did you study in China? Yes, <laughs> No? Why did you say she studied in China? For a year. For one year? Did you study in China? Please tell us the story. What part of China did you study in? China language. My major is Chinese. Major is Chinese. Did you go to China? Mm -hmm. What part? You don't remember? <laughs> China. 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 How long did you spend there? Um, six months. And why did you say, I asked you, did you study in China? Why did you say that? <laughs> hmm? What did you study in Shandong? Um, Chinese. Chinese language? Did you study Chinese history? Um, no. <laughs> no. Ikoi Shuo Han Yui? Oh! 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 So what you know, you're interested in Chinese history. You said the Western countries. What did they do to China in the 20th century? Oh, they invade the China. So mm. they, they made the made the colony the Shanghai, mm. Hong Kong, and Qingdao. Yes. So in the 20th century, the Western countries had much better technology and war technology. So Russia, <coughs> France, and the UK they all invaded China. And China had to make very bad agreements with them. Like they had to give them Hong Kong and Shanghai and give a lot of money to the Western power. Right? Yes. So because of this, Chinese people may still distrust foreigners. Right? So Chinese people might employ hard win-lose bargaining tactics with the Westerners or the foreigners. They remember that time. Right? <coughs> so nowadays, Chinese negotiators are getting exposure to the Western culture more. Okay, they're doing more cross-border deals. So their style of negotiation, especially the under 40 Chinese people, is getting closer to the Western style a little bit. Okay. So let's look at each one in a little bit more detail. So Confucianism. Do you know about Confucianism? Yes. Wang Yo. Yes, you do. You do. Wang Yo. Is this true then? These are the six core values. Moral cultivation, importance of interpersonal relationships, family, respect for senior people, pursuit of harmony, avoiding conflict, and face. Don't lose face. Is that true? Yes. All involved in... So the, we can see that religion can affect the culture, right? Also in the Western uh, one, right? So, do you respect the seniority and hierarchy? I find the Korean students are very respectful compared to the Western students. So it's easy, easier to be the teacher in Korea. <laughs> students respect more, right? Sometimes in the Western class, a student might come to the class drunk. <laughs> or they might, their phone might go off in the class more often, right? Or just it might happen, not, just, not that it does happen. Right? Or they just might miss the class without saying I'm the teacher, right? And they don't respect their parents like Green try to respect their parents, right? But they don't mind losing face. We'll talk about it later, right? What about Taoism? Wu Wei means actionless activity, to so act without acting or letting go. So find a middle ground or com compromise, okay? So both of these are less concerned with finding the truth, they're more with finding a way which works, right? which is harmonious, it might not be the right way to do it, but it keeps the harmony, okay? and it works for both of us, then it's okay. Then, how, do you know Guan Xi? Yes. What is Guan Xi? Do you have Guan Xi, good Guan Xi? Hmm? So, uh, <coughs> 
Business in China is not about business between organizations, but business between people. Okay, so for example, your successor does not inherit your friends and relationships. As I perceive, Chinese do business with you, not with your company. You can't be blue-eyed and believe you have made friends through one or two deals. It takes more time. So this is a quote from a Swedish guy who's doing business in China. Okay? So he is saying that if he leaves the company, the Chinese might not do business because they know him. Okay? So he leaves, he's going to take his friends and relationships with him. And the new person has to start again. So, uh, Westerners, we have a clear difference between professional and personal relationships. Okay, so I, I t I, if I go to work, that's just my work colleague. They're not my friends or close friends, right? Well, I understand from my wife, who's Korean, that in Korea it's more important to make a relationship with your work colleagues, right? Because that's the Korean culture. And they, they talk about personal things at work, like their lives, right, to the other people. But in Ireland, they don't really talk about personal things to their work colleagues, okay? They make a line between the work and the friends, okay? So it's the same for business, right? You're just, we're making negotiation. You're just my business associate. You're not my friend. I don't think we need to be friends. Why do we need to be friends, right? Do you understand? But in China, they don't make the distinction. So they think the interpersonal contact is important in the business. So we can have, this can be a problem when we have the Chinese foreign cultural relationship. Okay? So in China, for the Guanxi, they have two types of relationship. Either warm friendship, very close, or impersonal arm's length relationship. So either they're your close friend, or you're not, you're outside the circle. Okay? Uh, so, it's more complicated in the Western culture. We're not that much draw the line, right? More layers, or you can be here and here. So, outsiders or strangers are held to arm's length relationships, with, to which a distinct set of ethical standards applies. So, I have difficult, different ethical standards for my close friends in China, from Chinese, right? But if they are an outsider or a stranger, not my close friend, I have a different set of ethical standards. So I can treat them differently than I can treat them. Do you understand? Yes. So, uh, for example, Chinese negotiators generally send an inviting signal by calling their newly met foreign counterparts old friend. So if the Chinese person calls you old friend, it means they're giving you the signal that you are now in their warm friendship area. What should you say? Should you look enthusiastic and also call them old friend? Or just say, ah, oh, okay. You're just gonna say, okay. No, right, you should also call them old friend. And then how do you say old friend in Chinese? I don't know, do you know? <laughs> so you can wait for the Chinese person to call you that, and then you can you can uh, replicate, also call them old friends, and then you can be in the warm friendship area. If you're in the warm friendship area, they are going to treat you with a different set of ethical standards, treat you better, right? Then if you're outside, <coughs> so. In China, they're more worried about moral influence than the law. So in Confucianism, law is not very important. Okay? It thinks that people's behavior can be influenced by self-regulating moral mechanisms. Okay? For example, instilling a sense of shame in people. So somebody in China once explained to me about the Guanxi, especially the people who graduate from the university, the same university. Right? They have a group of friends. Okay? And then, if they do business together, and one of them cheats the other person, or deceives the other person, then they're going to tell all the other friends. And then that person is going to be outside the group. Do you understand? So they're going to be shamed. Do you understand shamed? In all of their friends. So this kind of system is like a self-regulating moral system. 
Okay, if I do something wrong to one of my close friends, they will tell my other close friends. Everybody will know about that. And then I get some punishment. Okay? Not by law. But if you're a stranger, outsider, okay, and I do something wrong to you, the law maybe is not going to punish me, and also I'm not going to get any punishment, this kind of punishment of shame. Right? So can you understand why they have different system for treating their friends and treating the outsider? Right? So <coughs> we have to just be aware of that. So they don't involve lawyers much in the negotiation process. So we saw, I mentioned about the Korean company. Surprised that the Swiss company made a 150 page contract, right? So the Western companies are more interested in lawyers, getting lawyers involved. But in China, not as interested in having the lawyers. Usually just at the end, very end of the contract. They don't rely on the law too much. So, uh, the, also the respect for hierarchy and reciprocity. So you guys understand about respect for hierarchy. So, for example, when a Western person comes into the room, there's five Chinese people there. Who should they shake hands with first? President. President. Well, I don't know that. I'm just going to come in and shake hands with each person. Okay? And then the president is going to feel bad. Probably they're the last one, the most important person, right? And I shook hands with the other people first. They lose face. But I didn't understand about that. Okay? So it's important to find out who you should shake hands with first. Who is the leader? It's important in China to know who is the leader of the team. Another example is using the formal title, the correct title for the correct person, okay? rather than just their name. If I just call them their name, they might not be happy. <clears throat> so we have to also make sure we don't make them lose face. Do you like losing face? Do you understand to lose face? Maybe I ask you a question and you don't know the answer, you might lose face. No? Don't care? <laughs> no? So, losing face can be diminished by criticism. Do you understand criticism? I tell you do something wrong. It's always difficult for Chinese people to accept the Western culture of constructive criticism. Okay? So if you do a presentation, I'll give you some constructive criticism. You can do this better, you can improve. Something you do well and something you can improve. But constructive criticism approach is not work well in China. They don't like criticism. Because if I tell you you did something, you can do something better, or you didn't do something well, then the other people is all listening, then you lose face, right? You look bad in front of the other people. So we shouldn't uh, use this kind of constructive criticism, which works well in the Western culture. Okay? Doesn't really work well in the uh, negotiation in China. You don't want to make them lose face. So how do you feel in the class if I give you some criticism, constructive criticism? Is that okay or do you feel bad in front of the other students? Okay. You feel okay? You don't feel bad? You're okay? Which is better, I tell you by yourself or in front of the other students? Or it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter? Are you comfortable giving constructive criticism to other people in front of groups? Sometimes. Sometimes in the class I ask you to give feedback to the other people about their negotiation skill, right? Do you give them feedback or do you just say nothing? <laughs> Which do you do? Give, 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 give. Do you give feedback? Do you, give the, do you feel bad when the other person gives you the feedback? No, no it's okay. That's a constructive. Constructive means the criticism is good for you because it means you can improve the next time, right? So it's helping you to improve the next time, okay? So then, uh, let's talk about trust and ethics. So, if we don't have a pre-existing relationship, there is very little pressure on consumers or suppliers to respond to Western-style market research. So in China, I tried to do some, I was doing some research, right? I tried to do some questionnaire, but people don't reply. 
it's very hard to do the research in China because they don't know who you are. They don't feel like they should reply or tell, tell you the information, right? So in the end, I had to just try to rely on some of my, my the head professors, Guan Shi. He had some friend who worked in the finance industry or some friend. Then I met them and did an interview. The only reason they talked to me was I was the friend of the professor. Do you understand? That kind of way. So, for example, in, in Taoist ethics, it's okay for Chinese people to deceive researchers, right? Not if they just do it to harm the researcher, but if they want to help their friend's interest, right? Then it's okay to deceive the researcher. So, different uh, idea. What about the war strategy? You seem interested in the Chinese history. Do you know about the Chinese war strategies? What's the name of that? Uh, okay. The right, the right one, name and mm -hmm. tip. Uh, Kampok means the tip strategic war strategies in China Chinese name. <laughs> so Sunja Kampok is the one book mm -hmm. of the war tactics and strategy. Okay. So there are a lot of tales in Chinese literature, okay, and they can encourage deception when dealing with more powerful hostile opponents. Okay. Italian history, Greek history also has that kind of thing, right? They have a story about uh, a commander who had 500 troops against one who had 10,000 troops. And the commander who had 500 troops, he tricked or he deceived, he lied to the one who had 10,000 troops, and then he killed them all, right? So they think that's good, right? That was a good way to win, by deceiving, right? Do you know the Spanish in South America? Spanish? Yes, the Spanish, when they went to South America, they captured the Inca, Leader, right? At the World Bank. Okay? And they told the people, give us all the gold, ransom, right? Give the gold, then we will free the leader. Did they free the leader? No. No, they lied to all the people. They asked all the, his best warriors to come to the square for his release. We're going, but don't bring any swords. Just come to the square. We're going to have a big festival to release the leader. And then they, that was their plan, to kill all of the best warriors. They had no weapons. So they tricked them. What do you think about that story? Their guy is a hero or a bad person? Why? But some people think he's a hero. He just had 500 Spanish fighters and the Incas had millions. But he was able to bring down the empire by killing their leader and their top warriors and top leaders all together in the square. Right? Great job! Right? So if people read that kind of story, and they think he did a good job, then they might think it's okay to deceive people. Especially if you're a big company, and I'm a very small company, right? Then it might, they might say, we can, it's okay to deceive. So, <clears throat> this can be a problem for negotiators. People have different ideas about what is ethical and what's not ethical, based on their history. Okay? Uh, what's a good way to behave? So trust. So trust building is a delicate and time-consuming process. Can you make trust very easily? Will you trust me immediately? No, right? You have to take time. So one way to do this in China is provide some references <coughs> from highly respected companies that the Chinese trust, either Chinese or foreign companies. If you have references, other companies you did business with. Or you can prove, I did business with this company, we have a long relationship, prove it to the Chinese, it can help, right? They can see that you already have, were trusted by another company, okay? Then there are three images you need to cultivate. Cultivate means uh, make or grow. The first one is of a polite, respectful individual, okay? So, like you said in Korea, 
cultural elective, be polite and very respectful, okay? And make sure that you give face to the high status officials. Don't be condescending. Do you understand condescending? I'm from America, so I know better than everybody else. America is the best country in the world. You're just from China, what would you know? Right? That's not condescending. So avoid the condescending that I know better than you. Okay? The second one is a sincere, trustworthy negotiator. So like we provide the references from our past to show that we're trustworthy. To be sincere, don't just say things to the Chinese that you don't mean. Sincere way. And the third one is a caring friend. Caring friends understand their Chinese counterparts, personal needs. They express an interest in their families and they want to make a long-term relationship. So an example of this is one American business person, he was doing a negotiation with the Chinese. The Chinese mentioned that his child was sick. So the American guy bought some medicine and some drinks and things for his present for his child. Okay, is that caring? Is that caring? You understand caring? Caring means you care about other people. Okay? So, uh, again, if they say something that they're doing something, you can give them a card. Do you understand a card? A good luck card or that kind of thing. Give some small gift. Right? To show that you're caring. It works with women too, not just Chinese negotiators. If you show you're caring, can help you. Girls, how, how can the guys show that they're caring? What kind of things do you want them to do? Give them some tip. What can men do to show that they're caring? Send messages often. Anything else? What do you like men to do to show that they're caring? What kind of manner? Like this one, respectful, polite manner. What about you? Um, um, you talk good, good. Mm. What about you? Um, you so <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no, right. What's, what's wrong with that? Did um, hmm? you learn? Send messages often, right? Don't just ignore, send often messages. Buy some presents sometimes, right? Use a nice manner and nice words, okay? Say thank you. Thank you. <laughs> something, right? So it's the same with it's the same with the Chinese counterpart, okay? Same thing. When I was started working, I had some 70 volunteers that I was managing. And it was the same thing, they're volunteers, so I had to try to remember their birthday, okay? Or they did some, they came to some training course, I had to give them some small gift, okay? I had to, maybe they're not going to watch the video, I had to pretend to be interested in their families, right? Do you understand? Yes. Remember details. Politicians are very good at remembering details. Politicians are, one of the reasons you can be a successful politician is a very good memory, okay? So I met you before, I remember you. You told me you have two children. I remember you have two children. And I ask about your two children. I remember one is a boy and one is a girl. I remember one is doing their high school exam. Okay? That is kind of a caring thing. It shows you care about the other person. If I do business with an Irish person, that might help me, but not that important. But I know from Europe, Spanish and Italian people, they care a lot about that kind of thing. So I better remember. If I don't remember and I don't I'm caring to the Spanish and Italian people. They're going to get annoyed. And even though my company is better than the other company, they're not going to choose me. They're going to choose the other company. Because they care about them more. Right? Maybe they're more emotional than the Northern European people is not very emotional. Okay? Korean people, are they emotional? I think so, right? A little bit like Chinese people. You have to care about them a little bit, then they feel happy, right? But in Ireland, we're not that bothered about that, right? 
So maybe I'm not a very caring teacher. <laughs> because I'm from Ireland, right? But I have to try to be more caring if I'm in Korea. But I have to try and be sincere, right? Is it sincere if I say to you, how are you? <laughs> how is everything in your life? Your face? Is everything okay? Hmm? How is your study? Do I look sincere? No? Well, that's the problem for the Northern European and American people. How to look sincere? They know they should do those things when they go to China, but their face gives them away because we don't have the facial communication like you have in, in Asia, right? We have a very serious face and we don't smile much in Northern Europe. We don't know how to hide our face. So you can tell. I can't hide from my wife because she looks at my face, right? I'm eating her mother's food. Is it nice? I have... Yes, very nice. <laughs> my wife knows and her mother knows it's not nice, right? So I can't fool them, unfortunately. So I have to learn how to be more trick that I'm really a sincere and caring person even though I'm not. Right? <laughs> do you think I can do that? Yes. You, yes? you practice. I have to practice. <coughs> okay, so then uh, current trends. So Chinese business people are increasingly able to communicate effectively in English. And they're becoming more receptive to the type of business in Northern Europe or America, which is arm's length. You're not my friend, you're just my business associate. Okay? Uh, especially among the more technically competent officials or technocrats. Okay? Uh, Non-personal factors. I have a better product. This is what I would say. I have a better product. I have better technology. Okay? Why don't you do business with me? You don't need to be my friend. Okay? So this is becoming a little bit more common now more important than personal and cultural factors these days. Okay. So, what should we do if, the, if we disrespected the culture? So discuss with your partner. <coughs> we made a mistake, we disrespected the other person's culture, what should we do now? Discuss with your partner. lower people first, we call the Chinese person by their name, not by their title. Why? We made them lose face, we criticized them at the meeting. So what are we going to do now? We realized later, somebody told me, oh, oh, you shouldn't have done that at the meeting, that was against the Chinese culture, right? So what are you going to do now? What's your next step? You realize that you made a cultural mistake. Kim Gong Jim, what are you going to do? try to reassure the other side that the breach was unintentional. So, apologize and say, well, do you understand unintentional? Just explain to them it was a misunderstanding. When I come into the room in the US, I always shake hands with the first person. So I, I just misunderstood and I didn't mean to make you lose space. So explain. 
Okay? Explain that you weren't trying to harm them. Okay? So they might misunderstand. So you make some sincere effort, like you said, to rebuild the confidence. Okay? This can even make stronger in the end, right? Make the relationship stronger. So to sum up on the cultural negotiation, start with the gap analysis to identify how your negotiation style differs from the other side. Okay? Make your own negotiation style. Check the other side's negotiation style and find the gaps. Then do research so you can avoid cultural taboos. Okay? Go onto the internet, research. What is a cultural taboo in that country? Okay? So you avoid insulting them. Then, once you identify differences in your styles, here's a good tip. Go through an exercise where you play the role of the other person in the other culture. This is called role reversal. Okay? So, for example, in the US people are quite aggressive and talk a lot in the negotiation and give their opinion strongly. But Korean people might be very quiet and very good at listening and not giving their opinion. So you do a role reversal. It means that I, I'm going to be very quiet and just listen to you and I'm not going to say anything and you're going to try to be very aggressive and give your opinion strongly. Do you understand? So you try being the others to like practice negotiation with your friend, trying from the other side so you can understand them more. So if I do that kind of negotiation, I have to be very quiet and just listening. I can learn there's actually an advantage of being quiet and listening. Right? Which is, if you're very quiet and just spend a lot of time listening, it forces the other side to talk more and talk more. And maybe I can get more information by having the other side talk more and talk more and talk more, and me just listening. I can get more information, right? So then I understand, maybe I'm talking too much and I'm giving the other side too much information. So I need to stop talking so much. Do you understand? So I can learn by taking the other role in the negotiation, in a role reversal. Okay, so do you have any question then about comments about what we studied today? Okay, you are in China, can you give us any just uh, tip about negotiating with China, or maybe something you think which was more important that we studied about negotiating in China? So, how can we make guan xi then? If we understand that guan xi is important, how can we make guan xi in China? Probably you know better than me, because Korean culture is better than it's closer to Chinese culture, right? So, how do you make guan xi in Korea? How do you make guan xi in China? Ask them for lunch or dinner to make their friend. Anything else? And give some small gift. Okay. And tell about Korea or Chinese culture. Talk about it. But how do you know when to give somebody a gift? For example, I got a gift from one of the guys I play soccer with. I was very surprised he bought me some gloves. He said, oh, your hands might be cold, right? Never happens in Ireland. So I thought, what does this guy want from me? Why is he giving me gloves and worried about my hands being cold? Right? And then, do I give him a present back? I didn't give him any present. He gave me another present again later. But I never gave him any present. So how do I know when to give the other person a present? When is the appropriate time? How do I know? After one week, knowing the person, two weeks, one month, two months? When should I give them a gift? Is it uncomfortable if somebody gives you a gift that you just met? Or that's okay? <laughs> it's okay? You feel uncomfortable? Then how do I know when to give to the person a gift? It 
how, how well? Oh. It matters how well they know the university. Yeah. But how do I know? That's what I'm asking. Where's the point? Where, because I never give any gift. So, when should I start to give the gift? Oh, one month. One month? Okay. Alright, so let's finish there for today then. <laughs>